reactions and I look forward to the discussion. Um, I hope everything works on the technology side. <laughs> you should see now uh, my presentation and uh, yeah, maybe I just like share a couple of like insights of you from my background. Originally, I'm a computer scientist and then I did my PhD uh, within the area of human, uh, like let's say, tailor maintenance, a remote maintenance for industrial robots together with companies in a TNO-like uh, extra university uh, institution. And I came to TUDOF for my postdoc and kind of stayed here. Um, <laughs> and um, my interest, and that's maybe I, I dive a bit in the domain context because that's really relevant for my research. And I'm not sure how many of you are already familiar with that. So I try to bridge the area of manufacturing with human-centered uh, design models. And uh, may some of you I already know, I, I read the, the names. You are familiar with one, but maybe not with the others. So please, I would try to kind of give a bit of an introduction to more or less the problem. So, um, so you should see my video now. And you know that the development of human industry can be developed into four industrial revolutions. So mechanical um, revolutions, so um, steam machine and these kind of things, electrical engineering, electrical introduction, then computers and automation. And then finally, this is what we call now the fourth industrial revolution, uh, where you have automation uh, coming to a new level with artificial intelligence, uh, new types of robots and these kind of things. And the interesting thing is, um, yeah, within that area, also the, the work of people change a lot. So we're not facing only a technological change, which is called in this fourth industrial revolution, for, uh, industry 4.0, but it is also happening in other parts of the world within different names, for example, made in China 2025. Um, but we're also encompassing um, well, a social change. So there is an aging society and we are also having uh, some uh, migration streams. Um, and here we have all these questions about how are, is this future of work within manufacturing looking like? This is getting much more, um, this question is getting much more interest at the moment. So for example, the World Economics Forum, Forum or there was also very cool uh, conference from Stanford uh, on, on AI and the future of work. I'm not sure whether you were aware of that. Otherwise, I should just share um, uh, the link maybe. And um, I see this kind of research within this context, of course, not solving all of this question. Um, and the interesting thing for me is that there are basically four different types of future scenarios. So, which you can lead, read in literature, and there's a very nice, unfortunately, German paper uh, who kind of summarizes a bit of that research about future of work in the production industry. And they come basically up with like four different streams. The first one is that the robot will take over. That's what you mainly also hear in mass media. And I think everybody, if you have been tortured with this kind of, or oh, the robots will take over the world stuff. Um, there is also a contra scenario, which is more or less on the, okay, within that new technology, we also can use this new technology in order to come to a more human-centered new type of organization. And these are the homogenic, um, either the one win or the other scenarios. And there are also other scenarios that are discussed in literature. One is definitely that there will be winners, let's say in the higher, uh, in the higher up, um, uh, quali in a higher qualified region. Um, for example, uh, yeah, if you regard like our jobs in the end, or I, I love this quote, which says, well, there will be two types of people in the world, those who tell computers what to do and those who are told by computers what to do. I think this, this polarization scenario goes in this direction. And, and then there is also another scenario, which is also interesting to have in mind, that stuff is dissolving and dissolving. So you don't have any boundaries anymore with respect to space and also hierarchy because of the strong modernization. So these are the two more or less diversification scenarios. And uh, my faculty has more or less the um, aim to design for our future. And if we want to go in the envisions future, that we also say it's the preferable future, then we choose, choose to design for the scenario of these four, which also for our side is the most preferable one. And this is the, the second one where the humans are helped by technology, which I call it, among others as the operator for that zero scenario. And what does this operator for that zero mean? 
Well, you have this fourth industrial revolution stuff is getting much more complex, less transparent, but we still have in high demands of safety and of course efficiency. And the humans and the robotics colleagues need better ways to communicate with each other in order to make that happen. So apart from the factory 4.0, we also need the operator 4.0, which we envision here a bit in the superhuman style. And um, how does it look like exactly? The, the basic paradigm is that we have this cyber physical production system, which is more or less the manufacturing environment. And we have the human in the center in the interaction with that system. And we have more or less technology helping this human to be better uh, in his or her work and enhance the physical capabilities. So this could be, for example, using an exoskeleton. And um, then we have um, the enhancement possibilities of the sending capabilities. So that's where I talk a lot here in this talk um, about using augmented virtual reality in order to improve um, uh, on the one hand the sensing capabilities, but also on the other hand the cognitive uh, capabilities. But you can also envision much more, uh, yeah, different functions than AR and VR in these kind of two realms. And uh, one thing that's very important to understand is that there are, we have like technical challenges, which are mainly discussed, so complexity, uh, dynamics, so that stuff is not non-linear, uh, and then we don't have a tra not transparent situation of the manufacturing environment. Um, but we also, and these these challenges within the manufacturing industry or the robotics domain are very much discussed a lot, but people tend to only talk about the technology. And if we regard on the theory behind of a socio-technical work system, then this looks like this. So you have some kind of work cell and you have some input coming in, you have some output going out and you have, of course, the task and the physical system involved with the task. And this is what we call the technical subsystem. And a lot of stuff is only like what you read in the literature at the moment is only focusing on this, using AI for uh, predictive maintenance or something like that. Then it's kind of like centered only on that, that part of the system, but the system is larger. We have the people with these cognitive and social abilities, and we have the structure of the entire factory or manufacturing environment, which is, of course, interacting a lot with the technical system. And we, of course, need to focus also on the interdependencies in order to really make the entire thing work. And that is something, well, I think the designers among you or kind of people that have something to do with you, in fact, say, yeah, well, that's logical. That's what we always do. Um, but it's not entirely logical, especially in the manufacturing domain. There was a lot of stuff that was only focusing on the technical development. And there are a lot of uh, opportunities if you want to use human-centered um, or human-computer interaction within these industrial environments. You have less training. You might have a higher safety, uh, a quicker problem solving, and an increasement of the well-being. Um, and this comes more or less to our guiding uh, questions, which are a bit stolen by uh, from the Dutch research agenda for, for artificial intelligence. So we try to design an augmentation layer so that humans and robots can productively interact and understand each other. Um, and we want the human to trust the autonomous system and we want to enable task sharing, so mutual understanding uh, between both partners. Yeah, in order to come to such a nice, um, yeah, well, handshake situation uh, where it's not only the human doing the work, but it's also not only the robot doing the work. So, and what would we understand by this human robot co production, which is uh, the framing that we had? Um, if you regard manufacturing environments, this stuff looks like normally like this. So, you have a lot of like sometimes dirty machinery, big machinery and some robots that are encaged. So you can see the bottom here, there's a robot who has a safety cage around it. And uh, humans are basically only able to kind of interact with these big robots from a distance. Um, and this is currently a bit changing because there are these collaborative robots, which you also, I think, already know. And they are designed so that the human can work in close interaction with them. And we don't require any fences anymore. We can have direct interaction, theoretically quicker programming. And the market is increasing a lot in this area because these kind of small robots can take um, away a couple of like small manufacturing uh, tasks and they're much cheaper. 
and uh, yeah, they're quite promising, but um, we still have some stuff to, to solve there. Maybe as a kind of overview, why this is interesting or why the market is kind of increasing at the moment. Um, if you regard um, high uh, large enterprises, for example, uh, automotive is not a perfect example, but yeah, let's use automotive. Um, you have a high production volume and you have different parts that are coming from that have low um, uh, that have low, uh, high production variation. So for example, I need a whatever car and I need a specific kind of seed. I need a, so the car itself has, comes with a lot of volume, but the different components come with low volume. So, and this is making the um, high, um, uh, the, 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 the large enterprises um, being enabled to automate part of the production already quite quickly within the third industrial revolution, let's put it like that. Um, and uh, they can do highly automated stuff. They can do high volume, low variation stuff quite well, and they have optimized the factories for that. Um, but if you regard small and medium sized enterprises or um, also p other people that do, let's say batch size one or small batch size production, they are less automated, less low volume and higher variation. And this means uh, we need a better human robot collaboration on this low volume um, area. So how does it look like? We have the human on one hand, the robot on the other hand, we have some kind of interface in there. And I still stick very much to some quite old theory um, from Sheridan, where you have where you say that you have um, different tasks from human. The human needs to plan the task, teach the robot, monitor if the robot is doing the right thing, intervene, eventually teach again, and then learn. And that still is more or less the basic things that still are there. Maybe they're a bit quicker than they were before. And this kind of human supervisory control is um, yeah, using a lot of different mental models. So I don't want to give you too much in-depth discussion, but you kind of have a mental concept of stuff, how stuff works. And what is quite interesting that if you have this kind of control chain, there are a lot of different mental models that are coming to pass. For example, if you here see the different components, the human has a mental model of how the robot will operate. The displays will show a specific representation of the robot, which is always only a picture and depicts also the mental model that the programmers of the display or the interaction um, software has. Then, of course, we have an internal uh, mental model of the computer, which might be a diff bit different to what the human actually sees and can understand. And everything which has been uh, designed as being a control panel also has an embedded um, uh, mental model in there, how it's designed and how stuff would work. And the interesting thing within manufacturing industry, this is a bit of a dancing bear problem. The dancing bear problem is well known in human-centered interaction uh, theory. So you are so glad. So if you look at a bear that is dancing, of course it's animal cruelty and we know about that. But if you look at a bear and you possibly you like it and you say, well, cool, the bear is dancing. And you think, oh, well, that's cool. Because you never saw a bear that was dancing. Um, but if you regard yet yeah, human dancers and you give A or B values for that, the bear doesn't fit at all these kind of cl classification. But you're still happy that the bear is dancing because it's the only bear that you know. And this is more or less the same what happens with human interaction, especially in specialized industry. You're so happy that something is solving your problem that it might be overcomplicatedly solving it, but you're still happy. Hashtag SAP or something like that. <laughs> um, and there are, this is just this, this thing that we are covering. And there are a couple of worker needs within that area. For example, of course, the human want to stay healthy. Um, the work should be sufficiently demanding, but not too demanding. The human wants to understand what's going on and how to control the system. And of course, on an even higher level, the human want to trust the system and don't fear that it kind of is overtaking him or her and feeling valued by the entire context. So a lot of stuff to couple, and uh, this is only more or less, uh, the, the basic layer is physical ergonomics, and we have cognitive um, ergonomics, and then we have emotional aspects, or what we call user experience, um, which is a bit more than that. Um, and here, of course, there should be design methods for kind of making that clear. Uh, there are design methods from other areas, but they're not 
that well established within the manufacturing field. So coming to the overall research topic that uh, my uh, group and I'm <laughs> trying to couple is to how to design a hybrid human robot system that is able to optimize both worker well-being and the overall system performance to really come to some kind of handshake working together situation. I quickly go through some related research. I think a couple of people will know some of this. Um, first of all, I like very much the trading and sharing control theory so that if you have a human worker, then you have a specific load that that human worker is able to carry. And if I have a computer system, I can use that computer system in order to extend the capabilities of the human. So it's not only the human load, it is an increased load by having a computer taking part of that job. But you also can use the system in order to relieve the system. So the load is the same, but the human has kind of some relief in there. Uh, or you also can use it as a backup to the human. And But then also there are some fields where you say, okay, but not that many, to be honest, uh, where the system or the auto uh, um, automatic system is replacing the human. But with a less load, because the human is much more capable still than um, an autonomous system. And I also like very much the levels of automation. Also, this is quite old, but nevertheless, especially kind of refined for the field of manufacturing. So in more or less, it gives a great, uh, um, yeah, kind of um, yeah, difference between the total manual uh, um, case and the totally automatic case. And it kind of defines some, some more or less discrete areas in the mean, uh, while where you can say, OK, there is kind of a um, especially we are interested in this supervision and intervene case and that not so much in the uh, closed loop uh, case. And of course, there is a lot of classification on how humans and robots can interact here, the so-called levels of interaction on the left side um, about the constellation of the group. So between humans and robots, multiple humans, multiple robots, and on the right side, more or less the uh, quality of the interaction. So is both are both players active in the task? Is one only supportive, maybe some inactive but somehow present? Or is there some kind of intuitive handover thing? Of course, that's where we're all aiming for, but it's really hard to design. And then you also have this level of collaboration, which is a bit more on the physical side here, if you can regard the robot and the human. Either they're totally separated, that's the normal case for nearly all of the industrial cases that we are currently also inquiring. And these kind of coexisting or synchronized or even cooperation or even collaboration cases, so coming more and more to this kind of shared thing, that's still quite very unique because um, it's also with a lot of effort involved uh, within real industrial cases. There was a very nice uh, PhD thesis from uh, our uh, yeah, associated with the stuff that we are now doing. It's, uh, unfortunately, he doesn't work with us anymore, but if you're interested, he also had a very nice uh, work on using this kind of operator-centered production design, uh, and you can, can look it up if you want. And the other thing that we are very interested in, in order to make this kind of interdependent teamwork situation possible, we need to have um, legibility, so predictability, uh, between what the robot is aiming to do. And uh, this is has been proven to increase safety, comfort, surprise, or less than surprise to a certain extent, um, increase efficiency, and also the perceived value of the human worker. Um, and how do we do that? And how do we increase uh, also what on the human side is happening? On the robot side, legibility is more or less incorporated. But on the human side, we want to do um, situation awareness. You want to kind of get the human to a point that he or she is understanding what is going on. And situation awareness is basically a more or less a measure for understanding what's going on. Uh, and it kind of is defined in different levels. I know that there's a lot of like discussion on that, whether this is a val uh, valid uh, concept, but I like it very much because it's really applicable also for my domain. Um, on one hand, you say perception. I would like to know what is there. I would like to kind of be able uh, to identify all the critical elements. The second thing I want to comprehend, what is the meaning and the significance of the situation? And then I also, in order to plan and uh, to interact with each other, I need to be able 
to project how the future state will develop. And this is involved also with the concept of sense making. I don't go into detail here. And uh, then later on also into sharing the mental models between the human and the robot. So also this kind of if I know what a human what the robot is kind of aiming at, then it also will increase my situation awareness. Our specific focus is then to say, OK, we want to design this kind of augmentation layer for this human robot co-production uh, co within the era of manufacturing. And here I come back to the uh, socio-technical system stuff that I have introduced earlier. So we still have this human and robot cell with some input coming in, some output going out. And we have these uh, like combination of the social system and the technical system. And our augmentation layer is enhancing uh, the physical sensing and cognitive capabilities, mainly the last two, in order to come from this kind of normal uh, human worker to our worker 4.0. And we have these two factors, worker well-being and work performance that we want to optimize for. And the, uh, co uh, the specific focus that I would like to kind of enhance here, because other people within my group are more on the cognitive side, for example, or more on the physical side, I'm using augmented virtual reality as a tool in order to kind of um, uh, yeah, improve this overall system and to come back to these uh, research questions. And then breaking down these research questions a bit so that you can have some comprehension on, on what you're actually doing. Um, so we want to design a human uh, augment, uh, augmentation layer so that the humans and the robots can productively interact and understand each other's behavior in context. And here, let's break that down with respect to the literature and also kind of the stuff that we actually can measure. Uh, we want to help with situation awareness. We want to help with sense making. We want to help with decision making. And we want to help with the sharing of mental models. So let's have a bit of a dive in. For example, if you want to improve the situation awareness, uh, what you could do is like we, we also um, are, of course, interested in level one and level two situation awareness, but mainly we are also very much interested in having level one and two and then the level three, which is the projection. I want to know what the stuff is going to do. And a very basic example, maybe, but quite comprehensible of what is feasible is increasing the safety by um, projecting the future trajectory of a driving robot. So here's the example study. Um, we have a person walking a specific uh, way and we have a robot where we know the robot will have a specific trajectory. And we have two conditions. In one condition, we don't have a projection and the other one, we have a projection on the floor. And uh, here you can see it's based on a, on a video study. And you can see this is the video material that the participants were look, watching as. And here, the, normally, the, the system would, uh, the, the, um, uh, the participant would be interrupted to watch the video and ask what he thinks or what she thinks that the robot will do next. And you can see here, we're doing these experiments within the era of uh, SEMXL. And yeah, that was quite, yeah, predictable. So we had different scenarios. Um, of different interaction scenarios, and you can quite see if there are specific type of scenarios. It's quite really helpful to have some kind of projection in there with other scenarios. And this was on scenario four, for example, this was that the human is actually doing a task and then the robot comes in. We don't have any significant difference. Um, but um, that was really, really nice to just see, okay, what can we do in the real world on the one hand, but also on with respect to these um, situation awareness. And the other example is not with driving robots, but with um, moving robots, uh, collaboration robots. And here you can see that we have made that task a bit up because uh, yeah, in order to have it a bit more controllable, there is a person packing stuff into um, uh, for packaging. And part of it should be done by the person, and part of it should be done by the robot. And that's more or less the same, like more or less similar setup than uh, the, the first study. And um, what we're doing here, we're uh, using the same uh, situation in virtual reality. So here in virtual reality, you can more or less also say, let's switch on a, a perceived future trajectory of the robot. For example, here you can see that small 
um, a moving uh, trajectory so that there is some kind of project and possibility of the future. And of course, you can have a lot of different visualizations for that. Um, and this helps you to understand, OK, what will the robot will be doing next? And the nice thing is that we're not only able to do that in virtual reality, but we also can use augmented reality for this. And here you can see someone putting on the Microsoft HoloLens. And we have developed some nice framework where you have, um, you can see the robot moving and also on the left side, also the virtual robot moving. Uh, we have more or less a framework where you can have all the stuff that you were seeing in virtual reality. It's developed in Unity. And with that kind of feedback framework to the robot operation system, you can have the same visualization stuff also happening in augmented reality. And the question is here, and the study is unfortunately ongoing, sorry for that, um, which kind of visualization would help and in which scenario does it help? Does it help in real life um, situation? Does it help in the uh, only virtual reality environment um, when yeah, where are the benefits? Where did you get the biggest benefits for this kind of situation awareness with respect to understanding what the robot is going to do next? Okay, and where do we apply that then? This is more or less the, um, the, the, the last case that I want to show you. And this is an application where we have, uh, we work together with a robot, man uh, with a bicycle manufacturer. And the idea is to share tasks within bicycle manufacturing between human and robot, because there are some tasks that are really not easy automatable. And how are we going to kind of do this kind of task sharing? And if we do this task sharing, how are we going to communicate the task sharing and uh, the stuff between a human and a robot? Yeah, this is much more to it. So we have done quite a stuff, a uh, couple of stuff so far that. We have uh, developed a digital twin of the SEMXL environment within Unity so that you can use that for experimentation. We have designed some kind of control room features within Unity for SEMXL, which we are hopefully implementing somewhere in the future, also there in real life. We did a couple of studies on automation uh, capabilities for this bicycle case. Uh, we did a couple of papers on using augmented virtual reality for helping within the field of manufacturing and also for planning manufacturing tasks. If you want to read more, I'm totally happy to share also some more examples later in the uh, discussion, but I just wanted to conclude it here. Um, yeah, this is, everything is only possible because we have such a great team um, and uh, all of the work is no, not the work of someone alone. It, it always is the combination of people and I have a wonderful team. I'm so happy uh, that we work together. Um, I have a quick video. I'm not sure I need to look at the time, uh, which I could share with you of like more or less all of the projects that we have going on right now. But I'm not sure if we have the time or we want to start the discussion first. Thank you very much for the attention. And um, yeah, if you want to look to uh, watch the video, we can also totally do that. Thanks. Thanks, Doris. Um... Is there any immediate like question that people have for Doris or else uh, I'm actually quite happy to see more examples because I think that they're, they're great. So uh, that's actually quite exciting. So yeah, Doris, can you maybe okay. quickly show? Yeah, okay, let's begin. Thanks. Yeah, okay, okay. Just I try to do it because I try to have it running with sound, which is um, hopefully working. <laughs> uh, no, that doesn't work. Because if I try to upload it, uh, that is not working. Okay. Um, yeah, let's see if it works. If you get, if you don't have sound, please let me know. Sound? No, we okay. don't hear anything. So you, you have to narrate. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. That's also something I could do, but they have such a nice sound. Um, okay. Let's see if it works now. Do you have sound now? Hey. Hello, welcome to this virtual tour of our research projects at SumXL. The research we do at SumXL is focused on the future of manufacturing and sustainable human robot interaction. This is our team, and we all welcome you. We're excited to tell you about our research and show the great facilities at SumXL. Hi, I think most of you already know me. I'm Joris van Dam. I work at the Applied Labs, but I also work here at SumXL. And here at Samizel, I help to develop 
all of the research facilities for our projects. And I also help bridge the research we do here at SonicZell with the research we do at the Applied Labs. So let's have a look inside. So this is the main hall of SonicZell. All the robots can be found here. It's 2,000 square meters of robots and very cool projects. And in the cobalt area, we have the RoboFeeds project. And in the RoboFeeds project, we're helping a bike manufacturer to do production of bikes with cobalt. Let's have a look at some more projects we do here in the cobalt area. Hello there, I'm Jonas. I'm an XR developer. My primary work concerns the topic of digital twinning. This does not only include the visualization of cyber-physical systems like robots or AGVs, but also the development chain behind it. Hey, this is Elvis. So over the previous year I have assembled and have been developing the ROS composite pick and place workbench and uh, together with others have been working on tooling so that we can visualize uh, soft robotic um, actuators in real time in AR. Apart from using cobots, we also do projects with mobile robots. Using mobile robots can drive autonomously around factories. Let's have a look at that. Hi, I'm Dennis. This year I'm happy to be a member of two projects. First one is collaborating and coupled AGV swarms where we use mobile robots to improve intralogistics. And second one is RoboFit, where we use robot arms to improve bicycle assembly line. Hello, my name is Martijn, and I've been researching the possibilities of applying spatial augmented reality in the smart factory context. An example of this is to use projected arrows to improve the communication and safety of autonomous vehicles. Hi, my name is Peter Keesman. For the KKS project, my colleagues and I have been working on a fleet management system called Rooster. Rooster's goal is to simulate, schedule and plan tasks for a robotic fleet in a warehouse situation. Hi, my name is Neil Nagda. I'm a controls engineer on the team. And for the past year, I've been working on setting up navigation software for multi-robot systems so that robots like this one can be used to carry stuff around factory shop floors and warehouses. On another front, quite recently, I've been involved in extending the Bob Rob project, which is a robotic arm program to paint. So let's have a look in the rest of the Sonic Zell wall. Here at Sonic Zell, there's also a really, really big robot. It's called a gentry robot is situated in this corner. Let's have a look. This robot is huge. It measures 12 meters in length, 10 meters wide, and five meters high. Different types of tools can be attached to this giant robot. Aerospace engineers will use it for drilling riveting holes in giant airplane wings. But imagine our faculty attaching a giant 3D print head to this robot. Then we will be able to 3D print giant structures, prototypes of car bodies, or even large outside furniture pieces. All of these robots here at SonicZell produce a really amount of data. It's hard to comprehend for a human being. My name is Samuel kernan Kleder. I developed an assistant that can automatically generate a report based on a conversation with a technician. This saves time, reduced the perceived workload, and resulted in reports of higher quality. For my PhD, we'll be developing an assistance that can provide cognitive support to factory workers while they use analytical tools. <laughs> my name is Sude, and I'm going to join the department and the Koala project as a postdoctoral researcher soon in December. I've been working mainly on recommender systems uh, since my master's thesis in Stockholm, and then over my PhD, and then my postdoc in uh, AV to you Delft. See you all soon. Take care. Hello, my name is Santiago. I'm a product design engineer and I am uh, participating in the Diamond project as a postdoc where we are developing a digital intelligent assistant for supporting the maintenance activities of the maintenance staff at manufacturing companies. All of the data the robots create 
we also have developed a virtual world of SumXL. Let's have a look inside this virtual SumXL world. My name is Daniela van Poel and my work is mainly focused on extended reality or XR. I work for the Mirrorless project where we create a digital twin uh, where robots can be viewed and controlled remotely. For this project we create tutorials uh, where we teach how to use this digital twin framework. Hi, my name is Irina and I'm responsible for a virtual playground community. It's a community that connects researchers, students and startups interested in VR and AR technology. We have regular online meetups with experts from all over the world and we'll be happy to see new members. Hello, my name is Jasper and my calling is teaching, which is why I'm here to make all of these exciting new technologies accessible to students. Okay, so I think that's it. Uh, that's only the teaching program, which I, I kind of omit now. Uh, yeah, I hope you like it. Uh, we still have another, I have more videos because augmented and virtual reality is always with a lot of videos, but I hope you like to kind of give a bit of a feeling what we're doing. Yeah, this is great. Thanks, uh, Doris. <laughs> it's really, it was, really exciting stuff. It was originally presented for our faculty because we didn't have the possibility to show them in real life. So um, that's the reason why it's a bit on the uh, IDE side of telling stuff. I just wanted to kind of share that with you because it gives much more tangible feeling to it. Yeah. No, great. So with that, I was wondering uh, if anyone had some questions for Doris, like more like if you, about uh, the projects that you showed. Oh yeah, I see that people would love to, uh, if you have a link to this video, Doris, they, apparently people are very keen to. Uh... Okay, yeah, we ha don't have it online. We have showed it within this kind of uh, Dies Natalis thing. So that's something I can definitely show you. Um, uh, but I think uh, we, we should make a real version for YouTube because that was only for internal purposes. Uh, we will do that. Um, uh, I, I still hope that it will come soon and then I will share you the links. Cool. Very good. So I actually have a question to just to yes. kick it off, if that's okay. Um, well, I'm fine. And I, so, so actually, two questions because one thing that I think is really cool is that you're working uh, with an actual bikes bicycle company, right, on uh, on this co-production. So I was wondering, uh, are you also applying your um, extended reality for those people, so the actual line workers, and, and and do you know how they like it, whether they like working with the road, whether adding this uh, layer uh, makes it like their work, their, their they enjoyed more. I was just wondering. Yeah. So, so, so the real application cases within the augmented and virtual reality domain uh, are mainly for other uh, purposes, like especially for um, um, maintenance tasks. I did some old studies for that. Um, I can link them if you want. So there, where we actually did also a comparison on using students as participants for these kind of applications and real workers. And the interesting thing, which is maybe not that ob uh, maybe already obvious, is if you test these stuff with students, it's nice, you will get some kind of results, but in the end, you really need to test it with the real end user and they will see the stuff entirely differently. Um, so everything what we're doing, we also try to really involve the end users. Within the bicycle project, we're not actually there. What we did within the bicycle project, if you want, we can also share another video, sorry for that. Um, we built an envision scenario for the kind of co-production within VR because the problem if you want to talk with workers on what they like and what they would prefer, they actually don't have a clue what to long for and what robots are capable of and how could this envision situation look like. And we uh, basically were using the approach of using the virtual reality environment for yeah, setting them into that future scenario and then having a discussion with them. We did this together with RoboHouse and I think we officially release it, uh, the video or something like that soon. Um, and uh, this is where we applied human, uh, like human robot co-production for the, for the bicycle industry with virtual reality. The main stuff I'm doing on uh, augmented reality assisted things at the moment, I was doing a lot on maintenance and repair tasks. 
Um, I might come back to assembly, but at the moment we do composite layup. So what we do is, uh, as you saw, this kind of pick and play stuff with the with the robot and using the composites. Here is where the industry uh, in within the aerospace domain has a lot of interest. Um, and within the manufacturing industry, my main focus would not be the direct um, assistance for single worker cases. I did a lot of cases for multi workers. So if you have someone on the phone and uh, collaborating with someone local, a couple of situations that we have a lot at the moment with due to Corona, uh, this is where I'm, it's called computer supported collaborative work. There is where I'm, uh, yeah, have worked a bit more because like at the moment, everybody's doing repair and instruction maintenance, a kind of suggestion stuff. And there's already a lot out there in the industry. Um, so it's, it's not that interesting anymore because it's like a lot of stuff has been already discussed there. So only the more complicated cases, multiple humans or humans and robot systems, or what we will do in a Koala project, uh, this cognitive advisor, the um, the AI system giving you cognitive advisor. So that is going to be a bit more interesting than the uh, like normal. Okay, I know how the instruction works, and I give you some some tasks. If you want to read something on that, I have a very large comparison study um, with 150 participants. Um, but I'm not sure if I want to do that again. Um, uh, on kind of how AR and VR can, uh, AR um, visualizations can help on uh, this kind of instruction-based uh, stuff. Cool. Yeah. No. Definitely. So uh, if you can share it afterwards, uh, yeah, I'll uh, I'll be happy to. Um, Luciano. Hi, Doris. Thank you very much. This was a really fascinating uh, presentation. And I was, uh, I really like also the example you show, the, the project you show about the robot projecting, the expected trajectory on the ground. And yeah, I can imagine that really helps for the operators, for the people to understand, have a little bit more mental model of what, what the robot is intending to do. Uh, and I, I'm just thinking a little bit about this interplay. So as soon as you give this notion, so maybe they gonna feel uh, the operator might feel feel a bit more comfortable and get like closer to the robot, and that that could be like this kind of emerging interaction patterns on this, and that maybe the the um, so the mental the helps the humans to form the mental model but how does it also for, uh, helps the robot form the mental model and the adaptation on that so do you have any thoughts on that direction yeah so so the interesting thing is with the autonomous ground vehicles within factory inter logistic, uh, logistics this is a field which is rapidly evolving at the moment within the manufacturing industry so a lot of questions that we are discussing currently within the autonomous driving community is kind of entering the factory like on through the back door so a lot of questions that we have on the normal street interaction stuff is kind of entering now the manufacturing world so the question I think what is important to know is that autonomous ground vehicles are not entirely new to manufacturing. They are quite mm -hmm. common actually, yeah. um, but they are not self steered and kind of like swarm like behavior. They have the dedicated routes. They have the very, very strict safety routines on stoppings. If, if there is any obstacle, they need to stop and these kind of things. And they are ha mm -hmm. interacting at the moment quite predictable. So um, uh, because they have these kind of lines, more, for example, on the floor, which they are following and these kind of different passages and factories are designed in like compared to streets, factories are designed in such a way that humans behave as part of the machine. So there are very strict rules on how humans are able or like allowed to behave. And on these rules, it's quite easy to develop also rules for the robot. So it's kind of a very rule based and of course, safety critical environment. Um, so the real interaction thing is we would normally imagine it with like autonomous cars or something like that at the moment don't really arise because currently the systems are not really self-controlled. If they are getting, and that's a very nice vision that we have developed together with Magna. Magna is uh, a car manufacturer in Austria who are uh, using these autonomous ground vehicles and want to use them in a self-organized fleet. 
And here you start to have this controllability of the AI system because the system, like the system is independently going to decide what it wants to do and kind of self-organizing what it, the next steps will be. And here, and that's the point where interaction gets more important. That's why we came into that project. We're not that much the like typical robotics engineers. We are much more on the, yeah, still rule-based interaction. And uh, two things that we have inquired here is like we have a couple of different scenarios that we wanted to look into. And one is definitely the close interaction on the shop floor. And here is more or less the main question what you have with human steered forklifters, like the interaction with humans, walking humans, human steered forklifters and uh, HVs. And here the main thing is I want to know what the thing is going to do next. So that's why we came up with this projected trajectory thing. Um, I think it gets more complicated if you have mobile manipulators, because then you don't only have the, the robot driving, but you also have an autonomous part which is able to manipulate stuff. And this is going to make the stuff even more interesting. But we're not there yet. <laughs> Let's put it like that. So it, it, I hope that answers your question. Um, I can share a couple of links if you want with the case that Magna envisioned it. Um, and they build also nice videos. Sorry, this is just a bit of the industry domain. They always make videos. Um, and I will share the Smart Factory version of Magna, and this is quite interesting, actually, uh, where they also see a couple of, uh, and here, without, and that's maybe one of the topics that I want to kind of really raise, is um, that compared to the traditional manufacturing, uh, to, to, to the ma traditional uh, manufacturing, from the employees. where nobody really needed to take care that much of the human outside of safety um, uh, constraints, um now if the stuff is getting more and more intelligent we really need to take care about the interaction and this is quite new for that field yeah i hope that answers your question that does there's a lot of so thank you very much thanks thanks so i saw that akari raised his hand too and then david so, uh... yeah I, I just wanted to say it's it's amazing yeah i like especially this example with the uh, ground uh, kind of wheeled robot yeah because i'm myself doing uh uh, human AV interaction with autonomous vehicles. So uh, we also have this kind of uh, really nice uh, analogy there, I think. But uh, yeah, my, my question was basically the same one that Luciana asked, but I want to elaborate on that. Uh, you mentioned that uh, you're interfacing already now with the autonomous vehicles uh, industry. And uh, well, the way I understood it is that you're trying to bring some of the approaches uh, that uh, they're using into the workflow, right? But uh, I was uh, also interested if uh, some kind of uh, uh, AR, VR based interfaces are already being used uh, in autonomous vehicles, uh, interactions, interacting with humans. And uh, yeah, if, if you have any plans of going there at all, or maybe you just know of any relevant work, yeah, I'd be happy to look at the references. Uh, I have a literature survey for that if you want. I have a wow, graduation project and uh, you also can have our code. <laughs> and we also have the fleet management code that we published as TU Delft. Uh, you can also see if that helps you to a certain extent. Um, and yeah, let's just start to get in contact because we're currently proposing to put the yeah. stuff into an H uh, Horizon Europe um, attempt together with Magna. Um, because yes, I see that the market is increasing a lot within the FTS or Fahrerlose Transport System, that's the German world, uh, or the autonomous ground vehicles or the autonomous guided vehicles within the factories. I am not quite sure why it took so long, um, because there were a lot of systems already on the market, but there had been really a recent push uh, for that and new, uh, also new standardization and these kinds of things. If you want to elaborate further on that, we also have an international working group together with other universities on the topic. And if you want to participate, I'm always happy to have uh, new uh, people joining us there. OK, and that sounds email. perfect. Let's, <laughs> let's get in touch. Cool. All right, thanks, Sakari. And uh, David, David. Where's that button? Yes. <laughs> Top right. No. <laughs> I hate to change between different uh, systems and I'm always searching for this, the functions again. It's not working. No. Maybe uh, try the button. No, also not. Oh, 
you're gonna, you're gonna type the question. Perfect. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Give him a keyboard. You want to talk to us? <laughs> <laughs> Perfect interface. Okay, maybe also restarting. Sure. Okay, yeah. How do we evaluate that? That's very, that very good, very, 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 very good question. Um, so, um, situation awareness is more or less horrible to measure, and there are also some psychologists that disagree with the concept overall. Um, it has been proven to be very well, yeah, helpful for the aviation industry and also for military contexts, and it has been applied a lot in the manufacturing world. I am mainly using um, the uh, situation awareness uh, rating technique, which is a very brief um, questionnaire. Um, but to put it a bit on the context, I, like I don't do a real Sagat approach, which is the, the original Ensley approach. Um, but you saw that we, for example, use this interruption technique that we are interrupting on a specific point in the interaction which people are seeing on the internet in in, in the video, and on that point we are asking the questions on. Um, legibility related questions where we don't have standardized questions. So like, what do you think what a robot will do next? If you want, we also can share the entire study with you. I haven't published it yet, but uh, yeah, I should. Um, um, but there is a graduation uh, which has uh, a couple of these kind of tasks in there. Um, and then we, of course, also use um, experience usability. So there are also a couple of standardized questions that you can questionnaire that you can use from the usability side. And if you want to evaluate more into depth for presence uh, related things, if you really are in um, an augmented reality or virtual reality setting, then you need to um, also evaluate on presence. Um, and sometimes also really important to measure the immersive tendencies beforehand. So I have a kind of set of, of questionnaires that I tend to use, including then also uh, task load, you can use NASA, TLX, you can also use other methods. And if you want, I can, if anybody interested, I can just share the methodology that we are kind of now using most of the time. And I want to add that I'm only using it as a tool um, and I'm not doing research on these methods directly. I'm just like using them how they are recommended to be used within the UN factors domain. And I find it much more valuable to use standardized questionnaires as much as possible. Then you can really compare also to other applications if there are uh, really. Um, but for the manufacturing industry, the most of the questionnaires are not really validated for that application case. So they are validated right. for specific parts of the application cases, um, for example. But the most of the UX research is definitely on, let's say, screen based interaction. And we do much more than that. Right, I found my my uh, my microphone uh, button uh, again. So um, so that that seems very uh, uh, let's say uh, uh, really usability kind of questionnaires and usability kind of uh, of uh, methodologies. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm familiar with um, uh, with all of them, but uh, so I was wondering if you uh, look into well-being, then those kind of questionnaires they don't typically address that. Yep. And also, if you look into um, uh, the question that that concerns us at AI Tech, which is, uh, you know, do people actually feel responsible when they work with these kind of uh, robotic systems? You know, that uh, then then also we need other things than the the standardized uh, questionnaire. So yes. I was wondering if you could reflect on uh, on those two elements, uh, so well-being yes. and and, uh, and responsibility over what actually happens in the production process. Yeah, so we, from, from respect to the well-being, um, my chair is uh, Professor Peter Fink, who is uh, his, uh, yeah, more or less his special area is comfort and uh, well-being within the context of uh, flights, but he originally comes from the work ergonomics domain. So within the work ergonomics, there are a lot of like measurements that you can take, especially, for example, now for the bicycle case, we did a ruler analysis for the current status. So this is also a standardized method that you can use for physical ergonomics. Um, and uh, for in order to assess the quality of the physical interaction, uh, like before and after treatment, let's put it like that, we use these kind of um, standardized methods. 
There are existing comfort questionnaires, for example. I did a study on uh, comfort on uh, on the sense glove uh, stuff, for example. I think you know it with with uh, with Dan uh, and these people. Um, and here we use there are also some standardized questionnaires that we're using there. Um, within cognitive ergonomics, we work together with Chalmers University, and they have done a tremendous work on uh, cognitive um, uh, ergonomics within the field of assembly. And they also have very nice methodology which we applied. For example, also again, a CXI, that's also a complexity index, which they derive from the um, automation of the assembly tasks. And here we look into more or less also pre-treatment after treatment. So first for the analysis of a task for the different levels of automation and how the automatability. And then after we have finished, but we haven't done um, a really finished task yet, um, then the uh, plan is to look into the finished, um, the, the new version more or less, and compare it to complexity index and perceived cognitive ergonomic factors. So I'm mainly relying on existing methodology here because I have the feeling there are a lot of people doing great work there, which I can use then as a tool um, and then rather kind of focus on making the stuff work and seeing if our design is really kind of resulting in some improvement instead of kind of doing research on the methodology itself, if that answers your question. Uh, partly, I mean, I get your choice, but um, but my question uh, also was uh, uh, basically in terms of responsibility. Yes, what, what, respons what, what do you yeah. uh, what do you think um, we could use, should use, what we need to develop because it's not there? I understand you don't do it, but uh, but uh, yeah, could totally you fine. just reflect uh, on that? Um, so what um, we have is what we definitely have is um, we use the virtual reality setting for the bicycle in order to kind of use this as a tool within a responsible research and innovation approach with Claudia. Uh, from TBM to use more or less the VR envision setting within a methodology setting of uh, research, uh, responsible research and innovation. And they have kind of a bunch of tools on making sure that the workers' values are well captured and then embedded later on in the system. Um, and that's something I find very interesting and very relevant. Another study that we do, uh, yes, yeah, sorry, Nick, I see it. Um, and the, another study that I was doing was asking robot developers out in the industry if they are considering human factors and the end user at all. Um, because that's something where I wanted to start in order to just justify the need uh, at first, because there are a lot of people within the robotics domain, which you might know uh, better than I do, but also in the manufacturing domain who don't really see the necessity yet. So my study, what I was doing, and I can share the methodology with you if you want, is to go out and ask robot manufacturers in um, or robot builders within project contexts if they consider these kind of typical user-centric approaches that we use as a methodology. And the answer is basically, no, they don't have any clue and they don't think about the end user. And I think that's the point where I tackle this kind of responsible approach. If the developers don't care about it, then uh, we cannot fix it like afterwards that easily. Good, thank you. Great. Thanks, uh, thanks everyone. Thanks, Doris, also for uh, for this really, really inspiring talk. It's great. And um, so, yeah, like I said in the chat, I'll, I'll talk with I'll talk with you to see how we can share these references that you mentioned uh, the best with the uh, people that are interested. And thanks you for, very much for uh, for the for being here, everyone else for for uh, for for your for your attention. And uh, well, we'll see you next week. Thanks so much. And please send me an uh, in invitation next week. I'm so curious Definitely. to see the presentation of your other guys. Thanks. Definitely. See you. Yeah, bye. Thank you. Bye bye.